good to you all. You know, my daughter told me that there was no better church in this area than Bladensburg. When she first moved to Maryland area, I told her, you know, just check out a few churches, see where you might desire to go. She said, I already know where I'm going. I said, well, you know, when you get there, just check around. She said, I don't need to check. She said, I'm going to Bladensburg. I said, well, okay, who's the pastor there? You know, you got to check out. And she told me, she said, pastor is Noah Washington. I said, oh, okay. So I checked you out. <laughs> Found out that he was a righteous man. Amen. Um, my daughter she tells me, I said, you know, do you go check other churches? You know, you, there's a whole lot of churches in the Maryland area. She said, I don't need to go anywhere else. My pastor gives me what I need. Amen. 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 And that said a lot for me coming from a pastor's daughter. And um, I asked, I said, is he better than me? <laughs> That's the only ought I have against you. <laughs> you know, you have a wonderful pastor. I've watched his ministry for some years. Um, I've watched how people do things. You know, when I come into a place, I try to just sit in the background and look around and see how a pastor responds to his congregation. I listen behind the scenes to make sure that what's said publicly matches what's said privately. I match to want to see if the person is demonstrating that they have a relationship with Christ. And I can say that your pastor has all of those things. I feel comfortable with my daughter being here. Amen. Matter of fact, you know, I said, you, you, you fallen in love with your pastor so much, so, you know, I'm a little jealous. <laughs> you know, I've been pastoring her for some 25 years or so, and now she's here. I said, you, you love your pastor so much. What are you going to do when they, when they move him? <laughs> she said, well, I just have to transfer my membership with him. <laughs> she wouldn't even do that for me. So, Pastor Washington, to your family, I'm just grateful for the ministry that you are developing here, for the love that you show, and the lifestyle that you live for Christ Jesus. It's a privilege to be in your pulpit today and to share God's word. Thank you very much. Usually, I like to walk when I preach. I wish I could say that I was on the basketball court and I slammed in somebody's face and <laughs> came down and I was all by myself, fell all by myself. Nobody was around. I just wish somebody had been around and broke my ankle. So I walked around on it two weeks before I knew it was broke. So depending on how I feel when I start preaching. It might just be a little hobble, but I might move. Um, it, it's, I kind of go under a little bit. That's not the ankle, that's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> As I began to share with you this morning a word from the Lord, I want you to know before time, I am going to redefine generation curses. Sister Broussard, it's good to see you. It's good to see you. 
I love you too. It used to be, she used to be a member of Ethnic Temple. Pastor Watson, you just take it all my members. <laughs> Amen. Um, I'm going to redefine generational curses. Um, as I've explored in the word of God. And so as we go along, just walk with me. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, let's bow our heads. Um, Heavenly Father, once again, I just want to thank you for the privilege and the honor of standing before this group of people and ask that your Holy Spirit will be the interpreter upon the word of God to each heart. Now please take your manservant and hide me safely and securely behind the cross of Calvary so that only Jesus Christ may be seen, felt, and heard. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning's subject is visiting iniquity and showing mercy. Visiting iniquity and showing mercy. There is a misunderstanding that exists within the Christian community concerning generational curses. Most of the error in regard to generational curses emanates from well-intentioned yet wrongly taught elements that claim to be authorities on the matter of spiritual warfare. <coughs> this false teaching and misguided counsel has led many Christians to believe that their life carries a perpetual curse administered by God. Due to the family they were born into. The concept of generational curses falsely suggests that for at least three generations, unsuspected individuals will suffer the wrath and anger of God because of some sin that one of their ancestors committed. If this teaching is correct, then every individual lives under a perpetual curse because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Therefore, if I truly love others, the only righteous thing to do is separate myself from them so that they do not partake of my family's dark history. This misunderstanding centers on a basic fundamental failure to differentiate between God's dealing with the righteous and his dealings with the wicked. This teaching is an attack on God's law, God's character, and God's power. The spiritual warfare we encounter is Satan's attack upon the family to destroy it physically and psychologically. Satan has charged God with placing man in an impossible situation, of not being able to keep God's commandments and then taking out his vengeance upon their family's inherited weaknesses. Therefore, I like to propose two presuppositions to you. The first is, if we are living under the new covenant of Christ, the dispensation of grace as claimed by some, then how can we be held to the old covenant of Moses, the dispensation of law which delineates the curses? The second proposition is, if God punishes unborn children for three or four generations with the sins of their fathers, then God could not be just, and his word, the living word, Jesus Christ, has no power over sin. In order to receive a clear understanding of scripture, I suggest to you three principles. First, look at the entirety of scripture to obtain a full perspective on God's actions. For God says in Isaiah 28, 10, precept on precept, line upon line, precept on precept. Second, 
allow scripture to become its own interpreter. Second, second Peter 1.20 suggests that there is no prophecy that is of private interpretation. And so for those who would contend that generational curses would not be considered prophecy, then I would challenge your thinking, your conclusion that unto the third and fourth generation is speaking of future events. The third reason is read what the writer intended message was and is for the people of God. And so while it is true that I and my children suffer from genetic weaknesses of sin, I or they do not suffer for what I or my parents have done prior to conception. Although I or my children may pick up some bad lifestyle choices or habits from the parent, I or them are not condemned by a predisposition to do wrong based on my parents' decision to rebel against God. There is this lie that Satan has been masquerading, perpetrating, if you will, about our God, that we do not have a choice, and that God is unfair in his administration of justice and mercy. I suggest that God's word is very clear, that if you hate, have an intense, passionate, emotional feeling or dislike and detest for him, that you can't stand God or what he stands for and therefore reject him based on a deliberate choice and teach your children your choice. He will have an emotional dislike and detest for you and they will follow in the choice that they will follow. But let me tell you the rest of the story. You are not doomed. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're not doomed. You're not doomed to a life of bondage or suffering based on what your forefathers did or didn't do. They desire, their desire for lust of the flesh, eyes, and the pride of life has no power or hold on you. Just because your daddy was a rolling stone, just because your mother was low down, just because your granddad was drunk and a murderer, just because grandma consulted fortune tellers and had three children by three different daddies before she was married, just because your ancestral tree is full of fruits and nuts has no direct <laughs> effect on your destiny because you can exercise choice. Desire has no power over choice. Desire is strong want for something or someone even if it's wrong. It was Luther Ingram in the 70s who said, if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. If being right means being without you, I'd rather live a wrong doing life. But choice is a deliberate decision between right and wrong. So when Yahweh Elohim delivered his chosen people from the hands of their Egyptian captors, he was keeping a promise. Four generations in Egypt had concluded. Those in the first two generations are off the scene now. They they have died. They're, they're gone. They're, they're dust now. They have died without seeing the land of promise. Remember, God promised Abraham that after 400 years, he would deliver Israel in the fourth generation. Genesis 15 and 16. God said, look, Abraham, I'm, 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 your, your, your children are going to go to a land that's not theirs. They're going to have to go because this land is not abundant enough to fulfill their needs. I'm going to take them down to Egypt to, to be able to survive. And while in Egypt, there's going to be some bad things that happen to them. But in the fourth generation, I'm going to bring them out of that land and take them to a promised land. So for, for four generations, they were without the direct impact of God's influence. Jesus appears to be at a tactical disadvantage to Satan regarding the great controversy. For four generations, they had been exposed to and practiced principles and values that were contrary to the kingdom of God. 
for four generations. They were exposed and surrounded by violence in their communities and spiritual wickedness in high places. For four generations, they were exposed to the absence of God's physical presence and his influence upon their image, the ability to affect their character, to help them to become like he was by understanding their God and having connection with their God, by talking with their God and walking with their God and communing with their God and needing no one else but God while sojourning. In Egypt, they have been exposed to a plethora of deadly practices. In Egypt, they had been introduced to a pantheon of gods. They heard that the gods of the Egyptians would occasionally come and visit their servants to demand worship and sacrifice. This anthropomorphic presentation of God took on human-like characteristics when they visited earth. Some were represented with animal heads and human bodies. But during this fourth generation exodus, there were likely some individuals still living from the third generation of Israelites. God is now on Mount Sinai writing his character on some tablets of stone. Yahweh is visiting his servants. This is the closest the Israelites have been to God in 400 years. The mountain has been rumbling and moving for some time, and the people have become a little uneasy because they don't know what to expect from this God of their fathers. They are reflecting on the mythology of the Egyptians. So they begin to think is he upset? Is he angry? What are his demands? What is he looking for from this group of vagabonds? Then Moses begins to recite what God has written on two tables of stone. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity, visiting the uh, iniquity, visiting the iniquity of the fathers, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation, those who are coming out of Egypt. The fourth generation that's there and the few that are left from the third generation of them that have hated me. You know we all hate God. Don't get all uppity and sadistic about yourself and then begin to believe that you don't really hate God. Because anytime you choose anything but God, you are showing your hate for God. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We, we, we tend to think because we can sing a little bit and clap a little bit and shout a little bit that we love God. But you, you, you really know how we act during the week. I mean, you may not always do it outwardly, but there's those. Oh, yeah, let me stop right there. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy, showing mercy. Oh, yeah, I'm so glad that he shows some mercy. Showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. A generational curse claims that once you are dis- you've disappointed God, failed God, stepped outside his intended purpose for your life, God is through with you and your family for at least three generations, if not longer. That due to the fact that you were born and shapen in iniquity and in sin where you conceived, then it comes as a conclusion that God must punish you. 
because you have a sinful nature that desires what is contrary to the spirit and that the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature and because you have internal battles does anybody have some internal battles I'm talking about those things that you're fighting with that nobody has to throw up in your face your wife doesn't have to say anything to you your husband doesn't have to come in the room your children don't have to work your last nerve you do it all by yourself you're fighting a battle inside your head that nobody knows about and you're afraid to tell people about because to tell people about what's really inside your head would prove to them that you don't deserve to be the pastor of the church or on the elder board or part of the deacon board or the mother's board because of the internal struggles that go on inside of you. And because of the internal struggles that go on inside of us, we have been psychologically uh, hurt and damaged because we have begun to believe that maybe we're not worthy. And, and by the way, that's true. You're not worthy of anything that God gives to you. God gives it to you because he blesses you. God gives it to you because he loves you. God extends it to you because he wants better for your life. Can I hear somebody say amen? And so oftentimes, we forget to surrender to God. And we give in to, we give up on ourselves in our homes in our families I mean the man that you married he was the way he was when you married him he 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 he, he didn't change she's the same woman you married a few years ago. Yeah, she may have become a little thick around the middle. <laughs> but she's still the same person you married. See, we, we need to understand that, that this is not a generational curse. Don't, 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 don't my brother hide behind, well, my, my daddy did it and his daddy did it, so I don't have any choice but to do it. You lying to yourself. You did it because you wanted to do it. Don't blame nobody else for what you got into. <laughs> Because you are in conflict <laughs> with yourself constantly, you say you can't be a child of God. Therefore, God is not within you or about you, as John promises. But John 14, 17 says, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him, not neither knows him, but you, 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 you know him. He's the one that talks to you when you start to do something wrong. He's the one that says, apologize when you mess up. He's the one that says, get it straight when you go wrong. For he dwells with you and shall be in you. That's God promised to his people. That victory over sin is certain. And that overcoming character deficiencies is an absolute. I refuse to let Satan get inside my head and make me believe that I can't be right and get right and act right and live right because then I'm denying the power of my God. My God who says that he's able to keep me from falling. I don't know about you, but I'm just crazy enough to believe he can keep me from falling. Turn to your neighbor and say, he keeps me from falling. And then in his venomous attack, Satan punctuates this lie with a half-truth. That ye shall die in your sins. 
But Jesus is recording as saying in John 8, 24, if you believe not that I am he, that I'm the one who can deliver you, I'm the one who can redeem you, I'm the one who can fix you, I'm the one who can correct you. If you don't believe that I have the power to do that, then yes, you shall surely die in your sins. In other words, if you don't believe that I came to visit you and deliver you and redeem you from your sins, then you are hopelessly metastasized with sin. And you will die from your sin. I believe the hope of all mankind is tied up in the visitation of God. Notice what God came to visit. He came to visit the iniquity. Let that marinate for a minute. He came to visit the iniquity. The iniquity of the fathers. Their iniquity, he came to visit that which had hold of them upon the fathers, on, on, upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. This word visit to the Israelites carries tremendous significance. See, when someone visited, they would exercise oversight of a subordinate either in the form of an inspection, investigation, investigative judgment. When someone visited, they would exercise oversight over a subordinate, either in the form of an inspection and taking action to cause a considerable change in the circumstances, a considerable change, in the circumstances of the subordinate, either for the better or the worse. Thus the distinction between the righteous and the wicked. After 400 years, four generations with some still living from the third generation, God visits the iniquity of the fathers to have an inspection and take action to cause a considerable change in the Israelites' circumstances. I often consider why Jesus would want to visit us. I mean, I, 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 I don't like visiting people who don't like me. I have no need to go to somebody's house who don't care for me. I mean, I, I, I just want to know why would he want to visit me? Why would he come and visit me when all I'm going to do is not answer the door? Y'all know what I'm talking about. You, you look out the window and the curtain and, and you tell the children, Shh, be quiet. Don't, don't say nothing. We, we're, we're not home now. And, 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 and the children are trying to figure out we're in the house. We're, we're in our place. And why aren't we home? Uh, but, but, but you know, I, I, I'll tell you, I, I couldn't be Jesus. I just couldn't be Jesus because if, if I came to your door and I knew you were inside and, and you didn't want to let me in, I have to bust it down like SWAT. I mean, if I came all the way from heaven, I mean, whoever knows how many light years that is, and I came to heaven to visit you, and then you wouldn't even talk to me, I'd just think you out of existence. You wouldn't have to worry about no generational curse. No, 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 no. I, 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 I'll settle that thing immediately. I mean, why would you come and visit somebody who doesn't want to care for you but one day a week? I mean, they get dressed up and, and they come to church and they shout for a little while. I mean, I mean, I mean, on Sabbath, you know, we, we, we're fussing at the kids. Hurry up and get ready. Get out of bed. You know we got to go to church and meet Jesus. Some of y'all couldn't even make it to church this morning in peace. You know, I'm tired of being late for Sabbath school. I'm going to leave your, you, I'm going to leave your, oh, you, no. <laughs> But in Hebrews 2, 6, Paul says, but one in a certain place testifies saying, what is man? That thou art mindful of him. Or the son of man, that thou visits him. See, it's amazing to me that God would come and visit people who don't have time to get to know him. The reason it's amazing to me is usually individuals of celebrity status don't have time to hang out with common people. 
However, God comes and hangs out, visits with common people, even our iniquities. There is a desire for some people to be in the presence of celebrities to make themselves feel important. That's why some people are in church. However, God comes and hangs out, visits with us, because he wants us to know that if you're just around me for a little while, I'm going to change your circumstances. We ask for their autographs, talk about celebrities, when they are eating, we intrude on their private time, and if we have continued company, we eventually get around to asking them for something we desire that we cannot obtain ourselves. We want to take a picture with them so we seem important, and we will name drop just to let you know we're special. But I never heard of anybody asking the celebrity how they feel, what's going on in their life. Here's my number if you need to talk. If you're having a bad day, come by and I'll listen to you and won't pass judgment. We never think about asking God about his day. It probably doesn't cross our mind to just sit and listen to God ramble concerning the plight of the humanity and the watch care of the universe. It might even sound sacrilegious to some to just hold God in our arms and tell him, I love you. It's going to be all right. You don't have to worry about me because I'm going to accept the considerable change that you are about to bring in my life. See, every time God visits, he visits to make a considerable change in our circumstances. Oh, oh, oh let me talk about that for just a little while. In 1 Samuel 2 and 21, we have this statement, and the Lord visited Hannah. Hannah heard from the Almighty God in answer to her prayer after all natural possibilities no longer existed. We find her crying to the Lord for her need. That can be any need that you have. And in the response to the cry, that anguish of despondency, God responds. That response is clothed in the term visited. And the Lord visited Hannah. In other words, the Lord visits us in earnest prayer. Amen. If your home is not praying, you leave your home subject to attack. When you start to pray, Satan has to retreat. Amen. Satan's not scared of your bluffing. He's not scared of how long you've been in the church and the lineage of your family. He's not afraid of who you are. But when you start to talk to Jesus, yeah. it's something about when you talk to Jesus, yeah. Jesus always shows up. Jesus is not like us when we see it on caller ID. I don't feel like talking to that individual. Right now, I'm not going to answer my phone. I'll get back to them later. Jesus hears our call. He comes immediately. And when Jesus shows up immediately, he always shows up with power. And when he shows up with power, Satan has to leave. So if you want God to visit your home and change the situations or the circumstances in your house, you need to pray a little bit. No, you need to pray a whole lot of bit. You need to pray morning, noon, and night. You need to talk to the Lord with unceasing prayer because as long as you're talking to God, God is in your presence. And when God is in your presence, he is always changing your circumstances. When this fourth generation cried unto the Lord in prayer, in Exodus 3, 7, Yahweh made a visit. The Bible says, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrow. I'm just trying to clarify the visitation of God. The prophet Zephaniah records the importance of God's visitation in Zephaniah 2.7. He says, for the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. He will turn away their bondage and bring them out of confinement. 
If you find that this morning you are in confinement, maybe even solitary confinement, this confinement of circumstances and environment, hold on. God's about to make a visit to your house, and, and he's going to take you out of your spiritual bondage, and, and you will have freedom in God. Well, I have some good news for you. I have some good news to let you know that the Lord, their God, shall visit them. He shall bring about a considerable change in your circumstances. When the Israelites were confined, God made a visit. In Exodus 3 and 8, it says, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land unto a good land and a large and unto the land flowing with milk and honey. I'm just trying to clarify the Lord's visitation. And he that was dead, the Bible says, sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all. And they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us and that God has visited his people, Luke 7, 15 and 16. Every once in a while, we need an extraordinary visitation from God, a supernatural manifestation of his power. So Luke said, one that was dead yes. sat up and begin to speak. I don't know if you ever had that type of encounter with something that was lifeless and the Lord stopped by for a visit. Can I remind you that you aren't cursed? It's just time to experience the supernatural God, his power to meet the needs of his people. So while on the banks of the Red Sea, God made a visit in Exodus 14 and 16, and he told Moses, lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it and the children of Israel shall go across on dry ground through the midst of the sea. God still visits his people in supernatural ways. I'm just trying to clarify the visitation of God on the iniquity of the fathers. He that has my commandments and keeps them. He it is that loves me and he that loves me shall be loved of the father and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. The Lord of hosts, the king of kings also visits in a personal way. The international standard version says I will reveal myself to him. The new international version says I will show myself Self to them. My translation says, I will make myself known to them. This word manifest, this word visit is to reveal to all the senses, every part of you, that the fiber of your soul, it is a qualifying visit to those who love and keep his commandments. When you say nobody can keep his commandments, that's a lie. Because when the power of God is walking inside of me, I can walk like God and I can talk like God and I can act like God and I can overcome what God is overcoming. It's not because of my strength, but it's because of the God that dwells within me. In Exodus 19, 16, and 18, God came for a visit, and it came to pass on the third day in the morning. I like that, the third day in the morning. It's always on the third day in the morning that you see the resurrection power of God. All God's trying to tell you is that on Friday, you'll have some dark days. On, on Sabbath, you will have some lonely days. But early on Sunday morning, I will rise you from your situation. In other words, God says, don't try to rush me. Don't try to make me hurry up in working on you. I'll take my time working on you. Because when I fix it, I fix it right. I do it right the first time. I don't have to come back for do-overs. I'm the almighty God. When I do it the first time, you can take it to the bank that is taken care of. All you have to do is call on my name. And the thick cloud upon the mountain, the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was altogether on smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. 
and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. I'm just clarifying. If it's okay with you, I'm just clarifying the good news about the visitation of the Lord on the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. See, sometimes when Jesus shows up for a visit, we don't appreciate it. Because, see, Jesus don't work the way we work. I want you to make my husband go out and buy me a dress, <laughs> some shoes. Don't let him fuss for at least a month. <laughs> when I call, he'll just say, honey, what do you want? I, 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 when I call on you, God, I just want you to shut her mouth. <laughs> don't let her say nothing. Don't say amen, brother. Just sit there and look. I, I, I don't want you to do anything. Just shut her mouth, God. Just, just quiet her down. That's, all, that's the only prayer I need, just for you to just, 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 just give me silence. Well, Mark 5, 17 says, and they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. See, whenever Jesus makes a visit, he's going to considerably change the circumstances for better or worse. This man who was influenced by a legion of demons had a visit from Jesus. And Jesus broke that influence over the man. Jesus influence versus demonic influence. A clean influence versus unclean circumstances. And Jesus wins. And Jesus wins. And Jesus wins. No matter how bad your circumstance, Jesus wins. No matter how long you're suffering, Jesus wins. No matter what people tell you about yourself, Jesus wins. No matter how many times you fail, Jesus wins. Jesus visits just one man to free him from bondage, not from a generational curse, but from the grip of a bad influence. It doesn't matter how many influences, one or 1,000, Jesus can break hold of the demonic forces even to the tearing down of the strongholds in your family. See, the hogs are running from or running because of the influence of the demons. And because the people in, their, in, their, in this region lost their herd of swine, unclean circumstances, they want Jesus to leave, cut his visit short. Get out. In spite of their hate for him, notice on this visit, he still changes circumstances. I'm just clarifying the Lord's visitation. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea and tossed with the waves. For the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch, did you catch it? In the fourth watch. The fourth generation. Did you catch it in the fourth watch? Yes, sir. Of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Yes. Notice the waters which jeopardized their lives and filled them with fear are the waters on which Jesus walked. The thing which distressed them because the very medium was the cause of Jesus' approach. The waters that shook them and the winds that terrified them became his mode of travel. Yes, sir. He visits them in the night, in the storm, in turbulence, in fear. The Lord visits his people. Yes, yes. So when I see the Lord visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate him, I'm not distressed about generational curses. Uh, quite the opposite. He's going to pay a visit to the iniquity. There's a going to be a considerable change in the status of iniquities. 
Hold on, hold on the nation and iniquities. Hold on to my family. Hold on, just hold on. Can I tell somebody? All it means is just hold on. I know you're getting tired. I know you're feeling weary. I know you're worn out, but hold on. I know you've been going through it for years and you're wondering how long you can go, but hold on. How long? <laughs> Not long. I, I just want you to know that it's a necessity to hold on. That's, that's the Christian's motto. The Christian motto is not give me all I want and all I need. Our motto is just hold on. If I can just hold on, I know I will make it over to the other side. I know if I can hold on. I know that things are going to get better. I know if I can just hold in there just a little while longer. God is going to turn my situation around because God promises me he's going to visit me. Satan wants us to believe. That we are trapped in sin. That our children and their children are destined to be held by the chains of sin. But I just came by to tell you that Jesus is ready to pay somebody a visit. And to fulfill his promise to start you on a journey to a new land. A large land. A great land. For unto us. A child is born. Unto us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Consular, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. See, his word to Abraham to bring Israel to a land of promise is now being fulfilled. That the great controversy is not a curse to bondage, but rather a call to overcoming sin through Jesus Christ our Lord. When his people were in the land of bondage, God made a visit. I am the Lord thy God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage I'm about to change the circumstances of your family you won't be making brick you'll be supping on milk and honey I'm about to change the circumstances of your home your children won't be slaves because I'm about to free them I'm about to change your circumstances turn to your neighbor and say he's getting ready to change your circumstances So Jesus says, I'm about to change the circumstances of your family by paying for the iniquity of your fathers and providing a declaration of dependence on me. I submit to you that Jesus is not speaking of future generations, but rather he's addressing the issue that is going to change the circumstances considerably of those that by nature rebel against him by coming to visit a place called Calvary. And becoming a curse upon a tree. For the Israelites, it was a redemption and a deliverance. Nobody can keep or take your family. There's no curse hanging over your head. There's no chain holding you to a season of distress. For the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, while we hated him, Christ died for us. I'm just declaring to you the magnitude of a visitation from the almighty God when he visits iniquity. Uh, I'm just wanting you to know that you're born free. Then the text proceeds by saying he shows mercy to thousands that love him and keep his commandments. This God that I speak of this morning is full of compassion for his compassion fail not. This God that I speak on this day is love. He loves you with an everlasting love. 
This God that I speak to you this day is totally dependent, dependable. His name is faithful and true. This God, the only God that I proclaim to you this ninth day of March in the year of our Lord 2013 is merciful and his mercy endures forever. When I accept the premise of generational curses, three or four generations don't outlast the mercy that's everlasting. Can I clarify his mercy? Mercy is ministry to the miserable. Mercy is compassion in action. You can call it compassion plus. Mercy is doing something. Mercy is doing something to relieve someone else's suffering. Mercy is God's way of not punishing us for the sins we deserve to be punished for. Mercy is deliverance from his judgments. Mercy is it looks at our future and not at our past. Can I just clarify his mercy? Who is like our God? You parting in iniquity because he delights in mercy. You will cast out all sin into the depths of the sea. I told you his mercy is everlasting and endures through every generation. It's his mercy that delivers me and fixes me and mends me. It's his mercy that delivers the distressed, the depressed, the distraught, the despondent, the disturbed, and the defeated. It's his mercy that outlasts my failures, my faults, my frailties, my failings, my flaws, and my filth. It's his mercy that handles my misfortunes, my miseries, my mistakes, my misdeeds, and my misconduct, and my mess. His mercy is everlasting. Well, can I just bring this home now? See, God gives us what we need. Not what we want. God saw my need before I knew I had a want. See, if our greatest need was for information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need was for technology, God would have sent a science. If our greatest need was for pleasure, God would have sent an entertainer. If our greatest need was for money, God would have sent an economist. But since our greatest need is for mercy, God sent Jesus. He sent a deliverer. He sent a redeemer. He sent his only son. If you don't know him, you don't know him by the many names that he's called. You may not know him as the Rose of Sharon, Lily of the Valley. You may not know him as the everlasting God, but I just came to introduce his name this morning to you. His name is called Mercy. <laughs> Mercy says that you should get a punishment. You should get a butt whipping. But instead of you getting a butt whipping, I'm going to give you a bowl of ice cream. That's Mercy. Uh, mercy says that, justice says that you ought to die immediately from what you did. But, but mercy says, no, nah, I'm going to give you another chance and 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 yeah, another chance and yet another chance. I, 
See, all I come to do, I didn't come to visit your fathers and punish them. I came to visit iniquity. Because whatever I come to visit, I change. And when I change the iniquity situation and circumstance in your life, I'm going to change your life. See, you've been thinking God has been, been, been holding you back. You, you thought that God was making you suffer. You, you thought that God was bringing upon you all the mess that your family did for years. And God says, wait a minute. I don't work like that. I judge everybody on their own book. I, I judge everybody. There's no book up in heaven called the book of generational curses. And it opens it up to see what, what you've done and what your family members done and what they've done. It's, it's called the book of life. And, and all you got to remember is, is that mercy places your name in the book of life. Mercy extends your name in the book of life. See, when God writes your name in the book of life, he writes it in bold print, underlined, italicized with quotation marks around it. Because when God came to visit you from heaven, when God left heaven's throne, when he came down to be in a manger, when he died upon the cross, when he walked this earth, he came and did it because he was visiting iniquity and showing mercy all at the same time. Time. I like the way my God works. He doesn't have to do a little here and a little there. He can do it all at one time. I'm not worried about what I'm going through tonight or what I'm going through today because I know that God can change it around all at I know that when mama and daddy mess up, that has nothing to do with me. Y'all go on and do your thing, but I'm going to a land of milk and honey. I'm going to a land of streets of gold. I know that God can make it happen all at one time. I'm not worried about anything. I don't go to sleep at night worrying about what's coming my way because I had a God who loved me so, a God who cared for me so, a God who came to visit visit me while I was still rebelling against him and change my circumstances all at one time. So somebody, somebody just needs God to change their circumstances. He's been visiting here now for this morning. I'm not concerned about whether you are influenced with a legion of demons. Or you just got one little thing going on in your life that you can't seem to shake. I just came by this morning to let you know that God is visiting you right now. And he's ready to change your circumstances. Now, I want you to understand before I ask you to come up, I'm not promising you that if you give $10 in tithes, he's going to give you 20 back. I want you to understand when before I call you to come, I'm not telling you that God is going to sit here and every day you walk, he's going to bless the ground you walk on. I'm not promising you that. I didn't come here this morning to promise you that when you go home this afternoon, your husband or your wife or your children are going to change as soon as you walk through the door. But what I am here to promise you is that God promises you that he's going to visit you. And when he visits you, you can take it to the bank. He's going to change your circumstances. Somebody this morning, you've been thinking I'm just trapped. Life is what it is and I can't do any better. I'm going to be what I am and that's all I can. But I just come to free you this morning and let you know that when you give your life to Jesus that he changes your circumstances. You didn't try everything else. You didn't try everybody else. This morning, I recommend to you now to taste and see that the Lord is good. So that individual this morning who wants to be free, I invite you wherever you are now to just make your way out. Tell the person, excuse me, 
I've just had a visit with God and I'm going to answer it. Won't you come? Won't you come, my brother, my sister? God says this morning, hey, understand, I'm a merciful God. Just let him out, just let him out. Somebody else, God is calling you and he's saying, won't you come? I'm not just calling people who are not in the church already. I'm calling people who've been in the church but recognize that I serve an almighty God. And I'm looking for God to change my circumstances right now. Sister, he's calling you, my brother wants to change your circumstances considerably right now. He wants to change what you're going through right now. He wants to fix it right now. You don't have to wait until your children do something spectacular for you to get off the hook. You can be free right now. talking to your heart. He's not finished yet. He's saying, I want to relieve you. I want to redeem you. I want to deliver you. I want to make you whole. I want, to, I want you to understand that I can start changing your circumstances. I'm a faithful and dependable God. I can change it. I can change it. I can change it. on you. He's saying right now, give me a chance. Give me a chance. Throw out your old thinking. Throw out your old ways. Throw, throw out what you've been thinking that I'm not worth it, that I can't handle it, that I'm not, I'm not able, that, that, that there's nothing good about me. When, 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 you, when you met Jesus, he made you good. He, when you met him, he, he, he extended to your mercy. When, when you met him, Jesus set you free.
I would be remiss if I did not fulfill my assignment this morning. Because when I came here today, the Lord sent me to, to, to just show you that you are somebody. But more than that, I have to keep mental count of what's going on around me. And all this is good, but there are two people yet here today that you have not responded, and you know God is calling you. And I'm just saying to you that don't let this time, this season, pass you by without having a considerable change in your life. Now, I know at this point, somebody feels that I'm on spotlight. And I want to let you know you've been on spotlight in God's heart for a long time. Heaven is already shouting, but they want to start doing some somersaults and some backflips right now. And I'm just waiting on those last two people to come. Last two, just last two. standing here and you're saying, wow, I want you to know that's the residue of what God is waiting on those two people. <laughs> you can wrestle with God, you can fight with God, you can go on with God, but the most important thing is, praise God, is to surrender to God.
Listen, this, this was not uh, by accident that you came here today, that Pastor Joseph came here today. This was by design because of what God wanted to do in your life. And um, I'm, I'm really trying to just close this prayer. I, I just sense that God is still trying to do something with somebody. And I'm, I'm not trying to scare nobody. I'm not trying to say if you don't respond to this appeal that you're going to die. That's, I'm, I'm just not that type dude that's into stuff like that. What I am saying, though, is when you don't say yes to Jesus when he visits you, it becomes harder to say yes to him the next day. So the Lord came to you last week and you said no. And then he comes to you today and says, and you say no. And the more he comes to you, it's easier for you to say no. The more you say no, it's easier for you to say no. And so the Lord set it up today so that he would have you in this church on this Saturday to say yes to him. And the easy thing to do right now would just be to close out prayer and for these souls to be recorded and for us to help them. But I just sense somebody needs to say yes to God today. And I'm, I'm really fighting hard because you and God both know that he's been trying to get you to say yes to him. But you've been saying no. And so I'm just asking in the name of Jesus that you would just finally say yes to God. Ain't nobody trying to judge you. And the reality is, so what? What they thinking? Because if they judging you, they need to be up here themselves. <laughs> That's the reality. If they looking at you, I, I wonder what she did. I wonder what he did. I, I, I ain't seen them in the church in a while, but they here today. Listen, so what? They need to be up here themselves if they judging. But you know right now that you need to say yes to God. And I'm just, I'm just saying very, very nicely before I pray, Come on and join this prayer and say yes to God. If you're getting hot and sweaty right now, just say yes. When you say yes, you'll start cooling off. When you say yes to God, you'll feel a lot easier. Just say yes. Somebody's praying for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm, I'm just praying that you would just allow somebody to surrender right now. Even while I'm praying, you can come. I don't care if you're downstairs. Come on, make that trip upstairs. In the name of Jesus, Father, you didn't just visit the iniquities of Israel. You have visited with us today. You sat on our lap. You sat next to us in our pew. And you told us that your passion is to visit us in our lives. To deal with us. And every time you deal with us, it's not going to be easy. We can testify you've dealt with some of us. It's not been a bed of roses. But we thank you, God, for the change. And we thank you, God, for mercy. We thank you, God, for grace. Thank you, God, for second chances. So today, Lord, I just agree with heaven for those that have said yes to you today. And I'm asking for you to take them now to where you want them to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, those of you that come down, I want you to...